Good morning, just good to be back again. Truly, God bless you wherever you are. I believe God's favor is upon you. Have faith and trust in God because He loves you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He is for you. Amen. I hope this morning that we will come to have faith to believe for all that God wants to do among us. Let us have faith to believe that God wants to do great work among each and every one of you. Amen. Let us pray and commit ourselves to the Lord. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this morning that we can come into your house, even for those who are at home, wherever we are. Truly, Lord, we thank you for your word, say, Lord, we shall worship you in spirit and in truth. Therefore, we are thankful and grateful that wherever we are, we can worship you in spirit and in truth. We are forever grateful to you and thankful to you, for you are good and your mercy and your forever. Therefore, we commit ourselves into your hand. Lord, we pray that our praise and our worship be pleasing unto you, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, we want to worship you in spirit and truth. And we declare your majesty, your greatness, Lord. Therefore, we thank you and commit ourselves into your hand and bless every home, Lord, this morning, Lord. We thank you, we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. I just want to read a scripture to you, church. Huh? Amen. Hallelujah. Book of Psalm 34. 1, 2, and 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. Amen. This morning we come and exalt the Lord together. Amen. Wherever you are, Amen. How do you express yourself unto the Lord? If you understand up then you leave up your hand, you leave up your hand. Hallelujah. Do it all unto the Lord. Hallelujah. We give Him praise, glory, and honor. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Truly, our God is an awesome God. Amen. Our God is the mighty God. He is great and mighty. Worthy is His name. Worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You are worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. God, He's an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. He reigns with power and might. Our God is an awesome God. Our God, He's an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. He reigns with power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Amen. Our God. He's an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above. We the power and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above. We the power and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above. We the power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above. Hallelujah. Holy, holy, awesome is the Lord our God. Great is 
preach your mighty name. Oh, yes, Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, who was and who is and who is to come. We give you thanks and pray. We bless your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Be glorified. In all the earth, be glorified, Lord. We thank you and we bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Thank you, Brother Stephen and all the musicians for leading us into a time of praise and worship. This morning, church, the title of my sharing is Spread Out Your Roots. Spread Out Your Roots, taken from Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 to 9. I'll read the portion of scriptures and it may appear on the screen as well. Thus says the Lord, Curse is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Verses 9 and 10, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Let me just highlight a couple of things here. For example, uh, in verse 5, that, that, uh, that portion of that part that says that who makes, his, who makes flesh his strength, in the original rendering, it's also put in this way, who makes arm his strength. The arm of human being, yeah? making the arm as your strength, a place to lean upon, a place to find your support. Secondly, in verse 8, you have, who will not see when, who will not fear when heat comes. It can also be said in another way, which is, he will not see when fear, when heat comes. He will not see when heat comes. And then thirdly, you have the heart is, in verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked. Desperately wicked in the scripture, it is rendered as a sickness. Another way of saying it would be, it is incurably sick. It is incurably sick. sick. And verse 10, I the Lord search the heart, I test the mind. Uh, the mind there in the original rendering is, Kidneys, referring to the innermost being or the innermost part of a man or a woman. Yeah? And it comes from the inner man. So, what is the context of the scripture before we move on? Let's look at the context of Jeremiah 17. Because when we uh, comprehend the context, we are able to see or maybe understand the meaning of what the portion of scripture that we have read just now. Without the context, then the meaning might not come across to us as what it should be. So the context is, is taken from uh, the book of Jeremiah, written by the prophet Jeremiah. And it was during this period of time where it is considered before the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. See, uh, Jeremiah served under five different kings, from the godly king Josiah right up to the vessel king or the puppet king uh, Zedekiah, who, uh, what you call, was under the Nebuchadnezzar rule, sorry, the uh, Babylonian ruler or Nebuchadnezzar. And so this portion of scripture came about before the fall of Jerusalem. Because after uh, Jeremiah 34, it will depict the fall of Jerusalem. So chapter 1 to chapter 33 of the book of Jeremiah tells us what happened or what the prophet prophesied and warned 
before the fall of Jerusalem. Secondly, it was during this period of time that a lot of warnings was gi were given by the prophet to the people as well as the rulers. Specifically to the rulers. Why? Because idolatry, religious wise, uh, idolatry was rampant and uh, the rise of false prophets giving false hopes or fake hopes were also rampant. And so what happened was Jeremiah was addressing all these things and the Lord was speaking directly to him telling him specifically what are the things to address with the people as well as with the rulers. Politically, at this time, uh, the land of Israel, which includes the nation of Israel and Judah, has been under attack by the Assyrians. The Assyrian Empire is a big empire. And followed by that, now there is a threat which the Lord said, He is going to use Nebuchadnezzar to correct his people. All right, in some of the verses, Nebuchadnezzar is being seen as the servant of the Lord eh? because he's going to correct the children of Israel who have backslided and fallen from the call of God upon the nation as a group of people who are supposed to glorify Yahweh. And so what has happened is politically the, the kings uh, both of Judah and Israel have tried to find what you call a place to lean upon because when they see this forthcoming threat from the Babylonians they went on to find what you call uh, solace in all the uh, surrounding nations and what they did was they tried to sign a treaty with all these nations and one of the most powerful nations at that time was Egypt all right so they strike a deal with Pharaoh and in doing so they almost become like a, a servant to Pharaoh and God was warning them against it. And the prophet Jeremiah was clearly saying that God is displeased with that because he wants the rulers to depend on him, not on all these powers that be or the powers that are existing at that time for protection. And so there was, there was a real dependence. The arm or the flesh that became their strength was Egypt. And uh, what do you call, um, they put their trust so much on all this powerful nation at that time and they have forgotten the very basic truth that is they should have rested their faith in God in His power and not in man's ability. And thirdly, there were socio-economic situations as well because the poor, the needy, the fatherless were oppressed and they were also neglected but more than neglected, they were being oppressed and God was not pleased with that. So there were three things, religious-wise, politi politically and socio-economic. And so you have all these problems that caused uh, the fall of Jerusalem. But all these things were addressed by the prophet and it is in this context that we have Jeremiah 17. But Jeremiah 17 actually starts from Jeremiah 14, verse 1. Because that's where the Lord said, I'm going to send a drought. I'm going to send a famine. Alright? So from that famine, uh, what do you call, uh, declaration, you have now, sandwiched in between is Jeremiah 17. So the Lord said, I'm going to send a, a famine. And in this famine, the Lord said specifically what He will do and what He will not do. And what He will not do, He said in chapter 14, verses 11 to 12, He said, Jeremiah do not pray for these people. Do not pray for these people for their good because I will not hear you. And even if they fast and give offerings to me, I will still close my eyes. I will not hear to their cry. Then he said, because of all the fake prophecies assuring the people there will be peace, prosperity, when actually the, the prophet Jeremiah was telling that God is bring, going to bring about judgment because of all their sins and rebelliousness towards him. So in verses 13 to 16 of Jeremiah 14, he said that there will be a lot of these false prophets rising and giving fake or false prophecies. Then in chapter 15 verse 1, the Lord went even further. He said, even if Moses and Samuel interceded, I will not hear. Moses and Samuel, you know, they interceded for the nation and their great intercessors, they, they stood in the gap every time the nation was in deep, deep trouble. And God heard them. 
But in this case, God told Jeremiah, even if Moses and Samuel interceded for them, I will not hear them. And so, what is, what is being projected to us in Jeremiah 17? It's a comparison. It's uh, what we will call an analogy or maybe a metaphor. A metaphor is uh, when you take an abstract idea and you use what you call a concrete example, be it from the nature or from any other uh, examples that we can see, feel and even experience, then you're trying to take the abstract idea and to give it a concrete meaning or application. So in this case, this is what God did. He took the metaphor of a tree and a plant and tried to address this issue of unbelief in his people and of faith in him. And uh, you will see that there was a comparison made from the portion of scriptures that we read just now that faith in God and faith in men has got its repercussions, has got its outcomes. And we will look into this one by one. Alright, so let's look at the first part. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Curse is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert, shall not see good when it comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. In a salt land which is not inhabited. First and foremost, this whole concept of curse. Now God does not take delight in cursing people. But more often than not in the scripture, especially from the first mentioned principle, now the very first time the word curse was used in the Bible is actually in uh, Genesis uh, chapter 2, if I'm not mistaken. All right, and uh, chapter 3, and sorry, uh, yeah, Genesis chapter 3, yeah? when Adam and Eve, uh, what do you call, transgressed and trespassed what the Lord commanded them not to do by eating the fruit or the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and of course, tempted by the devil, what happened was God said, first he cursed the uh, serpent, the devil. He said, you will bite the dust and you will crawl on your belly. Then he said to Adam, curse be the ground. See, curse is not only the absence of blessings, but curse is also when something that has been intended to produce a certain good result is now, as now has been revoked or reversed. For example, when God created uh, the universe, the world, man and woman, he, every time He created them, every day, yeah, day one until day six, He said, they look good. To His eyes, they were good. And then finally He says, very good, before He rested on the seventh day. Because all of His creation are functioning as they are intended to by the Lord. The Lord has given His divine intention and also His divine injunction in this way, saying that all that is created will function according as it has been created. Now, what the curse is in that situation is, the curse will reverse the whole thing. So, what was intended now, for example, the ground was supposed to yield all those fruitful trees and so on, they're not going to do so anymore. It's cursed. Adam has to toil, Adam and Eve and all of us have to toil to earn a living or to even put food on the table. And that's what happened. So the concept of curse in Jeremiah 17 is the same. It's when we put our trust in man, when arm of flesh becomes our place of leaning, we automatically position ourselves into the place where God's word cannot bring about the intended results in our life. And that's what happens. And, and, and it becomes uh, what you call uh, counterproductive. It becomes counterproductive. So do remember that God is not keen. He's not, he doesn't delight in cursing. For example, the Bible says, when we don't follow His word, automatically we place ourselves into the place of a curse or a condemnation. Those who do not believe my words are condemned. Are already condemned. All right, so take note of that, very important. Yeah? And, and uh, for example, to the Corinthian believers, the Apostle Paul said, you know, those who do not love the Lord Jesus, anathema. That means those, by, by just not loving the Lord or not following Him, you put yourself into a place of a curse. Anathema means curse. Curse be everyone who does not love the Lord. 
And then comes the famous expression, Maranatha, after that. Even so, come Lord Jesus. So what he's saying is, by doing certain things or positioning ourselves in certain position, automatically sometimes we expose ourselves to the danger that the scripture many a times wants us not to put ourselves in those particular positions. One of it is putting our trust in men, putting our trust in the institution of men, putting our trust in what uh, comes from this world and it demands our faith to be placed in it. And so that's, those are the things that we have to be very careful because uh, the issue of faith is a very important issue. And the issue of faith is the central part of our walk with the Lord. And, and the issue of faith has to be addressed appropriately because where we place our faith will determine whether we are walking in the intended path that the Lord has intended for us. Secondly, there is a wilderness implications in this. Notice that when you trust in man, we are all transferred into a place called the desert. We become like the shrub or a plant in a desert place. Salt land, parched places, no water. All right? And here you see the metaphor of a plant. The metaphor of a plant is being used here. Bible scholars have been arguing a lot about this shrub in the desert. What is it all about? All right? And um, somewhere in 1918, there were two immigrant, Jewish immigrants, immigrants from uh, Russia. And they were botanists, Ephraim and Hannah Haruveni, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah? They came to Israel at that time and they wanted to uh, find a plot of land and they just wanted to plant all the plants and trees found in the Bible. They want to make a collection of all the plants and trees found in the Bible and being botanists, they just wanted to come up with this uh, particular place where, like a big garden, yeah? where they can plant all these trees and, and plants that are found in the Bible. So they did that. Uh, of course, they didn't see the full famine of it, but then his, the, their son, whose name is Noga Haruveni, all right, you'll see on the screen now, he, they wrote, he wrote a book called Tree and Shrub in Our Biblical Heritage. Tree and Shrub in Our Biblical Heritage. This place is still existing in Israel, and I heard that some people who go for their pilgrimages there will stop over this place just to look at all the trees and plants that are found in the Bible. All right, it's, it's uh, by the pictures that I've seen, it's a really uh, impressive sight. Yeah? So in this book, he explained what is this shrub or plant mentioned in Jeremiah 17. And so it is interesting that um, this plant has got a name, and the name is Arar. In fact, he said in the Hebrew, Jeremiah 17.5, there is a play of word. All right, for example, cursed is everyone who trusts in men. You know, makes, uh, uh, what do you call? Flesh, his strength, or the arm of flesh, his resting place or support. Yeah? And what he says is this, curse is Arar. Arur, eh? and then that plant is Arar. So Arur is every, everyone who trusts in man, they become Arar, the plant. All right, that's a play of word between uh, being cursed and the plant that is found in the desert. Now, what plant is this plant? Right, you will see it on your screen now. The plant scientifically is called Calotropis procera. Uh, Calotropis procera, the genus Calotropis is found in a lot of places, including in Malaysia and even in the Indochina. But Malaysia, we don't have prolonged uh, drought, so we don't see this plant that uh, very many. Yeah? Uh, but in Malaysia, it's called, I think in Asia, it's called uh, Calotropis uh, gigantera, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah? But this one is Calotropis procera. Now, if you are in the Indochina countries, you will, you will see this plant because they have prolonged drought sometimes. You know, this paddy field will crack up because they are all clay, no water over many months. And then suddenly, out of the blue, you will see this green-looking plant, uh, maximum 10 to 15 feet, right in the middle of the field. Well, fruits, green fruits, flowers on top, purple color flowers, lavender color flowers, yeah? And every time I want to approach this plant, the farmers will always tell me, do not touch this plant or meddle with it. So I ask them why. They said, you will get allergic reaction because the toxicity of this plant is uh, what you call, it's unbearable, yeah? All right, by touching it, sometimes you get uh, some kind of reaction. So I look at it and I find it very strange that uh, this plant is so, what do you call, uh, amazing, yeah? In a dry, 
dusty and almost like a forsaken piece of land there, subjected to drought, you get this green looking, lush green looking plant, eh? and with all its fruits there. But then it's toxic. It's toxic, it's poisonous. The Bedouin people or the, the desert nomads, they call this plant the um, Sodom's apple or apple of Sodom because they believe this place was where the former city of Sodom and Gomorrah were located before it was destroyed by God. And so they call this Sodom's apple or the apple of Sodom. Another name for it is also cursed lemon. So think about this church. A cursed tree looks very healthy, lush green, with fruits in a very hostile place. And that is what the comparison is all about when it comes to comparing one who trusts in man instead of in God. I mean, you can look at the, 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 the uh, leaves of the tree is green and the fruit is so interesting. Yeah? When you break open the fruit, it gives you a kind of a, uh, what you call sound where you get when you try to uh, release air from your bicycle tire or even your car tire. Yeah? All right, and then it's all dusty and webby inside it, yeah? All right, it doesn't look appealing at all, and it's poison anyway. You can't eat it. So if you're in a desert and you are thirsty and you're hungry, just imagine you look at the, all these beautiful plants with all the fruits, and if you ever touch and eat them, that's it. That's the end of you. All right, because they are poisonous. And so what the scripture is saying is, um, look at, let's look at the application part. Yeah? What the scripture is saying is um, we have to choose whether we want to be in the path of blessing or in the path of the curses, what it is not intended to, to be. Yeah? And it is as simple as where we place our faith, who and what is our hope. Secondly, now the world demands faith. This is one topic we don't, of, of, uh, we don't talk uh, that very uh, often, yeah? is that the world demands faith. For example, if children are attending schools and then in the school environment they start teach, teaching about uh, what you call how human being evolved, then they will give you this uh, theory of the Darwin's theory of evolution and then they will demand that the children believe in it. So they will even go one step further by saying that all other beliefs cannot compare with this one. You have to place your faith and your trust in this particular theory. They still call it theory, but then they demand your faith. Now, you are a Christian, uh, what you call young man or young woman, or a boy or a girl, and then you are subjected to this, and you look at it, and then they impose it on you. They demand your faith to be placed in this set of teachings. And you know that God created the world, and He is the creator of this world. It did not evolve by itself. God is the intelligent design behind everything that we see and experience in this world that we are living in. All right, so we are constantly, constantly challenged to place our faith in things and everything that is out of the economy of God. That means in God Himself, in His Word, and in everything that He has ordained for us. All right, so. What, how can we address this, this matter, church? Very simple. Follow the steps of our Lord Jesus. You know, in John chapter 2, verses 24 to 25, it, I'll, I'll maybe read from verse 23 onwards here. Yeah? John chapter 2, verse 23, right after 25. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name. Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of men, for he knew what was in men. Now verse 24 says, Jesus did not commit himself unto them. The word commit himself unto them, Jesus did not have or put his faith in them. Interesting, isn't it? A lot of people are believing in you, all right, because they saw the miracles, and here comes a verse that says that, he did not commit himself to them. He did not place his trust in them. Because he knew every man who they are. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. He knows them. He knows what is in our hearts. And he knows that our hearts 
are desperately wicked sometimes. And so here, here the Lord did not commit himself. Probably that's how we can follow the Lord. That no matter what it is, be it in the physical world, in the secular world that we are exposed to, or even in a, a spiritual setting, yeah, that our faith is not placed in men. Our faith must rest in the power of God. Our faith must rest in the power of God. Not in the ability or the doings of men. And so let's look at the second part, church. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease yielding fruit. Now, what do we see of this portion of scripture, of one who puts his or her trust in the Lord, and the Lord becomes their confidence? It's the concept of blessings. And the concept of blessing, this is where the divine reversal happened. Yeah? And it happened on a tree called the Calvary tree. Cursed is anyone hung on a tree. If they hang you on a tree, in the Old Testament is considered a curse. When the Lord Jesus, according to Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 to 14, says that when he hung on the cross, he became a curse for us. And by becoming a curse for us, he reversed the whole process. Because of our transgression, trespasses, and, and you know, right, that every, uh, everything that is not our faith is sin, according to Romans, yeah? Everything that is not our faith is sin. And because we were so, our attitude towards God was so rebellious, and this is what happened. There was a divine reversal on the cross. The curse was swapped with a blessing. And the reversal was this, that we might receive the blessing of Abraham, which include all the promises of God, plus the blessed Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's where the beginning is. Because blessed is the man who puts his trust in the Lord, whose confidence the Lord is. He shall be like a tree planted by the streams of water, by the river. You know, that's where the title of the message is today. That is, spread out your roots. God has intended for us to be like a tree. Tree planted by the river of life. And there he says, spread out your roots. The stability of a tree is not the depth of its root. A lot of people think that the tap root is to go deeper, then only the tree becomes stable. But actually, how far and how well it spreads keeps the tree stable. According to botanists again, a uh, Tap root might go up to five meters, or maybe a little bit more. But other than that, it, a healthy tree, they spread out. And so God intended for us to spread out, to be stable, secure, and as well as to be blessed in Him. And that is the river of God. You see, the strange thing is this. When we place our faith in God, the river comes searching for us. Because that is the uh, principle in the spirit world. The river will come searching for us. Not we go searching for the river. So when we place our faith in God, automatically the Holy Spirit comes into picture. And you can find this in Ezekiel chapter 47. You can find this in Psalm chapter 1. You can find this in Zechariah chapter 13 verse 1. Chapter 14 verse 8. And of course, the culmination of all things, you will find it in Revelation chapter 22. All right. So we are supposed to emulate another type of tree, of a tree. For example, those who put their faith in man and so on, they'll become like the Ara tree, the Calotropis procera tree. Yeah? That is the uh, metaphor. But those who put their trust in the Lord and their confidence, the Lord is, they be, they follow, they emulate another tree, and it's not found in this world. It's not found in this. What do you call? Uh, anything that we can find in the agricultural practice as well as wild and the one that is cultivated. Yeah? And it is that we emulate the tree of life. We are supposed to emulate the tree of life. The tree by the river, the full explanation, if you say that the 
New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed, then we will see that in Revelation 22, the tree of life grows by the river of life. You and I are called the tree of life. More than any other trees that we can ever find on the face of the earth. Yeah? For example, if you want to see the concept of the tree of life in the life of a believer, just read the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 3.18 says this, Wisdom is a tree of life. That means our walk, what governs our thinking and our acts, is the tree of life. And that wisdom comes from God's word. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. All our action, fruit means outcome, our doings. All our doings and actions are supposed to be like that of a tree of life. Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. Hope in God is like the tree of life. And a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Proverbs 15, 4. Our words can be that which emulates the tree of life. So, what is, the, what is the main issue here, church? The main issue here is the heart. You know, Jeremiah 17.1 says that, God says that, you know what, these people, the nation of Israel, and the rulers, the people as well, this, their sin is written with a pen of iron, you know, with a point of a diamond. It's like engraved or inscribed into their hearts. Then you go to chapter 17, verse 5, it says that their hearts have departed from me. Hebrews picks up on this. An evil heart is a heart that departs from the Lord. And then 17, verse 9 says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and is incurably sick. Who can know it? Who can know it? And that's where the Lord says in verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart, test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Acts chapter 1 verse 24 says this, God is the knower of hearts. When the apostles wanted to replace uh, Judas Iscariot, who is dead now, with a new apostle, and they found two guys, and they were praying for the one that has been uh, selected, their prayer was this, Lord, you are the knower of hearts. You show us, Lord, who is the person. And this is the man, Lord, that's going to take over Judas' place. God is the knower of hearts. What a way to pray. 1 John 3.20 says, God is greater than our hearts. Sometimes we, can even, we cannot even understand our own hearts. But God is greater than our heart. And here he goes. Revelation 2.23 to the church of Thyatira. The very same expression that appears again and again in the Old Testament, especially in Jeremiah 17, here it comes. God is the searcher of our hearts and minds. Revelation 2.23 He is the searcher. You know, he said this, that I'm doing all these things, telling the church of Thyatira, yeah? because I want all the churches to know that I, the Lord, am the searcher of all the hearts and minds of my people. So, Let's take note of that, church. You know, because that will bring us to really comprehend what is this that the Lord is trying to tell us, yeah? What is it that He's trying to tell us? And what are the things that we need to look into? And so let's summarize. Let's summarize, yeah? We have to make a deliberate choice to place our faith and hope in the Lord in every situation of our life. Blessing and curse, somehow, it's, a, it's on a very thin line. Blessing or curse is how we position ourselves. In a day, I can find myself transporting myself between two places. I can be by the river, or I can transport myself back to the desert. If, the place, if unbelief takes over my heart and my mind. And that's why the condition of the heart has to be always at the feet of the Lord. Because He is able to help us out at that level and He's greater than our hearts. So we have to make a deliberate choice every day. Of, like the times and seasons that we are living now, we have to understand that uh, it's like a year of drought. It's like the heat is coming. And because we are living in the year of drought and the heat is coming, we have to make sure that we are placing our faith in the Lord. 
We are placing our faith in the Lord, not in men. We are not placing our faith in the institution, the system, or even in whatever that is convincing from men. Let's place our hope and faith during this time and season in the Lord, not in men. Because He assures us of a blessed path. Secondly, God has ordained us to spread out our roots by the river of life, emulating the tree of life. The eyes of the Lord runs to and fro throughout all the earth to show Himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal, faithful to Him. And the Spirit of the Lord is moving to and fro throughout the whole earth. The river of life is moving to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is faithful and loyal to Him. So let me close, church. Jeremiah 17, 12 and 14. 12, right up to 14. Yeah? A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. Follow after me. Yeah? Jeremiah 17, 12. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. Secondly, Jeremiah said, O Lord, our hope, you are our hope. You are the fountain of living waters. Follow after me. Lord, you are my hope. And you are the fountain of living waters. And then finally, he prayed this prayer in verse 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For you are my praise. Daniel the prophet, many, many years later, while under the Babylonian captivity, towards the end of it, prayed the same simple prayer. O Lord, hear. O Lord, save. O Lord, heal. Let's close with a word of prayer, church. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for your word unto us this morning. Thank you, Lord. We pray that your word will germinate in our hearts, Lord. Your word will cause us, cause faith to arise because faith comes from your word, from hearing your word, Lord. And as we look and continue to look to your word, Lord, we pray that our faith will grow, Lord. It shall be from faith to faith, O Lord. And in this pilgrimage of faith, strength to strength till we meet you, Lord. And Lord, glory to glory till we see you in the fullness of your glory. In Jesus' most precious name, we ask and pray. Amen. Thank you, church. i
Israel.